Hi everyone, Elizabeth here with another Quarantine Reads. Um, I've still been doing lots of reading this summer and um, if you haven't already, I would highly recommend checking out AADL's uh, Black Lives Matter discussion series. Um, the, we're doing a really cool um, Zoom discussion series where you can read um, a book about anti-racism or about black history or related to the Black Lives Matter movement and then um, participate in a discussion led by an AADL facilitator. And um, there's lots of information about that on AADL.org if you're looking for um, reading re recommendations related to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I've been reading a lot of those books myself, um, but there's tons of resources out there um, about that. So I wanted to just share some of the other titles I've been reading um, for, for this Quarantine Reads. So we have a good variety today. Um, I am going to start with um, this title, Ordinary Grace by William Kent Kruger. And um, I'm going to do what I usually do where I just read the um, publisher summary and then give my thoughts about it um, with a little more detail. So this says, New Bremen, Minnesota, 1961. The twins were playing their debut season, ice cold root beers were selling out at the soda counter of Halderson's Drug Store, and hot stuff comic books were a mainstay on every barbershop magazine rack. It was a time of innocence and hope for a country with a new young president. But for 13-year-old Frank Drum, it was a grim summer in which death visited frequently and assumed many forms. Accident, nature, suicide, murder. Frank begins the season preoccupied with the concerns of any teenage boy, but when tragedy unexpectedly strikes his family, which includes his Methodist minister father, his passionate artistic mother, Juilliard-bound older sister, and wise beyond his years kid brother, he finds himself thrust into an adult world full of secrets, lies, adultery, and betrayal, suddenly called upon to demonstrate a maturity and gumption beyond his years. Told from Frank's perspective 40 years after that fateful summer, Ordinary Grace is a brilliantly moving account of a boy standing at the door of his young manhood, trying to understand a world that seems to be falling apart around him. It is an unforgettable unforgettable novel about discovering the terrible price of wisdom and the enduring grace of God. Um, so I actually kind of disagree a little bit with that last part. I didn't find this book to be particularly quote-unquote religious. Um, Frank's dad, the main character's dad, is a Methodist minister in the book, so that does have kind of an underlying tone throughout, and they do attend church, and that's part of his growing up experience. But um, I didn't think it was, uh, you know, I wouldn't consider it I wouldn't consider this book necessarily about God um, or about any particular religion. Um, I thought that the setting was fascinating. Just um, the author captures this small town Minnesota in the early 1960s wonderfully. And he really captures Frank's innocence and how that is kind of lost over the course of the summer, which I feel like so many of us can identify with obviously in different ways, but remembering that feeling of when you realized that there were a lot bigger things in the world than you had previously um, come, you know, experienced or, or, or um, I guess just realized. Um, so I thought this book was excellent. Um, I, and this is coming from someone, from someone who don't, doesn't usually like to read about, um, necessarily coming of age stories. Uh, so it, it was just, it was really unique. And there is this underlying mystery um, kind of floating through it of these mysterious happenings and deaths that are striking this town over the course of the summer. But it's almost kind of atmospheric and you just really feel the sense of place in, in, this, in Minnesota and you just really get involved with the characters and the author does an excellent job of portraying characters' faults in line with their... Um, the, they're the good aspects of their characters and there's not really anyone that's good or bad you you get a sense of just what it means to be human so I really liked this highly recommend it um William Kent Kruger is a pretty 
he, he's written many books, but um, from what other people have told me, this is the only one I've read of his, and this is actually a little bit different than some of his other ones. He often writes um, books that are more mystery-based than this, apparently. So, highly recommend Ordinary Grace. Um, let's see, another one that I read, okay, this is, first of all, this is my personal copy of the book, so it's a little bit beat up, um, not a library book. I did not do this to an AADL book. Um, but this is, this is goofy. I don't usually read science fiction. I don't usually read cyberpunk. Uh, my partner really wanted me to read this. Um, it's called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. It was published way back in 1992 was the first um, publication of it. So it's like old. <laughs> um but I ended up really liking it. It's a crazy book. It's going to be difficult for me to explain, but I just wanted to share it because I haven't heard anyone talk about it um, in, except for my partner who suggested it to me. So I'll, I'll read you what it says. Okay. Only once in a great while does a writer come along who defies comparison. A writer so original, he redefines the way we look at the world. Neil Stevenson is such a writer and Snow Crash is such a novel weaving virtual reality, Sumerian myth, and just about everything in between with a cool, hip, cyber sensibility to bring us the giga thriller of the information age. All right. In reality, hero protagonist delivers pizza for Uncle Enzo's Cosa Nostra Pizza Incorporated, but in the metaverse, he's a warrior prince, plunging headlong into the enigma of a new computer virus that's striking down hackers everywhere, he races along the neon-lit streets on a search-and-destroy mission for the shadowy virtual villain threatening to bring about infopocalypse. Snow Crash is a mind-altering romp through a future America so bizarre, so outrageous, that you'll recognize it immediately. Um, yeah, so there's two main characters in the book, hero protagonists. First of all, the book is very funny. There's a lot of play on words, um, hero protagonists being a prime example, and then a teenage girl who is a skateboard courier, so she makes deliveries by skateboard. Uh, her name is YT, and there's basically a virus that has been developed that uh, has its roots in ancient Sumeria, uh, so you get to hear a lot about ancient times as well as modern times, and what it does is it basically destroys the minds of, progr of computer programmers. And so Hero and YT are teaming up to try to stop the villain who wants to spread the virus um, because it renders, uh, if they catch it, programmers, not only can they no longer program, but they're basically kind of like vegetables. Um, and so this, it, to this craziness takes place in both the real world, which is this like skewed America that, um, you know, is actually not that unbelievable that it might become that one day. And then the metaverse, which is a completely virtual reality that um, people can goggle into and interact with each other. And they have um, human forms in this uh, metaverse as well. So it did take me um, like maybe a hundred pages to get into it because it's, it's a little confusing. Um, but then once I got into it, I was loving it and I flew through it. And again, I don't like science fiction that much. And um, Neil Stevenson is actually credited for being one of the first um, kind of cyberpunk authors. So that was kind of cool to read. And he has a bunch of other books that people have recommended to me uh, once I mentioned, mentioned that I read Snow Crash. Um, so if you like it, there will be much more reading for you. Um, so yeah, that's Snow Crash. It says, it says on the cover that it was the number one science fiction bestseller back in the 90s. So maybe those of you who were um, reading um, back then will be able to uh, remember it. I don't know. Okay, let's see. Oh, this one. All right. This is Richard Ford. I love Richard Ford. I know he's not for everyone. This is his newest book, and it's short stories. It's called Sorry for Your Trouble. And I just find his writing very accessible, and I find the portraits that he paints of characters to be um, just really interesting. Um, but this is short stories, so there's a bunch of different plots in here. But it says, In Sorry for Your Trouble, the Pulitzer Prize winner and New York Times best-selling author Richard Ford presents a stunning meditation on memory, love, and loss. 
Displaced returns us to a young man's Mississippi adolescence and to a life-altering encounter with a young Irish immigrant who desperately and rashly tries to console the narrator in the aftermath of his father's early death. The run of yourself, a novella, sees a New Orleans lawyer navigating the sorrows that lie beyond the loss of his wife. And Nothing to Declare follows a man and a woman's chance re-meeting in the New Orleans French Quarter after 20 years and the discovery of what's left of love for them. Typically rich with Ford's emotional lucidity and lyrical precision, Sorry for Your Trouble is a memorable collection from one of our greatest writers. And I did, I did enjoy this. Um, it's definitely more, like it said at the beginning, it's um, a kind of on memory and love and loss. It's definitely features, um, in many cases, older characters, in many cases, people who have reached midlife or later and maybe aren't quite satisfied or aren't where they expected to be. Um, but I've, I've always thought Richard Ford was a great writer and I did enjoy this. And if you like short stories, this is a pretty quick read and one that um, would be good to pick up. Okay, so this I recently read. It's called All American Boys, and this is by both Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley. And I actually, this is a YA book. I read this because it was being considered as an option for the Washtenaw Read for 2021, and I cannot reveal if it was chosen or not. Um, but I don't usually read YA, um, and I thought this was fantastic and uh, very timely. And um, uh, I'll read you about it and then I'll say a little more. Rashad is absent again today. That's the sidewalk graffiti that started it all. Well, no, actually a lady tripping over Rashad at the store making him drop a bag of chips was what started it all. Because it didn't matter what Rashad said next, that it was an accident, that he wasn't stealing, the cop just kept pounding him over and over, pummeling him into the pavement. So then, Rashad, an ROTC kid with mad art skills, was absent again and again, stuck in a hospital room. Why? Because it looked like he was stealing, and he was a black kid wearing baggy clothes. So he must have been stealing. And that's how it started. And that's what Quinn, a white kid, saw. He saw his best friend's older brother beating the daylights out of a classmate. At first, Quinn doesn't tell a soul. He's not even sure he understands it. And does it matter? The whole thing was caught on camera anyway. But when the school and the nation starts to divide on what happened, blame spreads like wildfire fed by ugly words like racism and police brutality. Quinn realizes he's got to understand it because bystander or not, he's a part of history. He just has to figure out what side of history that will be. Rashad and Quinn, one black, one white, both American, face the unspeakable truth that racism and prejudice didn't die after the civil rights movement. There's a future at stake, a future where no one else will have to be absent because of police brutality. They just have to risk everything to change the world. Um, so this is written from the two perspectives of both Rashad and Quinn and the two authors, Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley write the um, alternating perspectives. And of course, like I said, this was super, super timely, um, very relevant. It was published in, I always need to look this up before I start and then I forget, um, 2015. So when I first started it, I was like, well, so much has happened since 2015. Is it still going to be worth the read or should I find something more, um, even, more recent but it holds up extremely well and it's it's such a quick read because it's a YA book and it's also such a quick read because it really is gripping and um, an excellently told story those of you who may have read Jason Reynolds knows what an excellent storyteller he is um, so this is a great book a YA book if you're interested in YA and a quick read even if you don't typically read YA and something a fictional account of what's still happening today that's certainly worth um, picking up and giving a shot. All right, I have two more. This one is also a brand new title, Saint X, and I believe her name is pronounced Alexis Shakin. Um, this one was interesting. So it's um, essentially the story of a, a girl whose older sister gets murdered on a family a Caribbean vacation and the younger sister who survives is only seven years old when this happens and then decades later 
the mystery remains unsolved. Decades later, she decides she wants to try and figure out what's what happened. So, okay, I'll just read it. Um, hailed as a marvel of a book and brilliant and unflinching, St. X is a haunting portrait of grief, obsession, and the bond between two sisters never truly given the chance to know each other. Claire Thomas is only seven years old when her college-aged sister Allison disappears on the last night of their family vacation at a resort on the Caribbean island of St. X. Several days later, Allison's body is found in a remote spot on a nearby quay, and two local men, employees at the resort, are arrested. But the evidence is slim, the timeline against it, and the men are soon released. The story turns into national tabloid news, a mystery that will go unsolved. For Claire and her parents, there was only the return home to broken lives. Years later, Claire is living and working in New York City when a brief but fateful encounter brings her together with Clive Richardson, one of the men originally suspected of murdering her sister. It's a moment that sets Claire on an obsessive pursuit of the truth, not only to find out what happened the night of Allison's death, but also to answer the elusive question, who exactly was her sister? At seven, Claire had barely been old enough to know her, a beautiful, changeable, provocative girl of 18 at a turbulent moment of identity formation. As Claire doggedly shadows Clive, hoping to gain his trust, waiting for the sh slip that will reveal the truth, an unlikely attachment develops between them, two people whose lives were forever marked by the same tragedy. For readers of Emma Klein's The Girls and Lauren Groff's Fates and Furies, St. X is a flawlessly drawn and deeply moving story that culminates in an emotionally powerful ending. Um, so this book at first definitely was very gripping and I couldn't put it down. I thought it would be a little more thrilling based on the first like 50 pages and it slows down a lot and it really isn't what I would call a thriller. It's more just a fiction book of this girl's kind of obsession with finding out what happened to her sister. And you, do, you don't find out until the very end. So there's not, you're still waiting to um, kind of figure out. It, it, it takes a while to figure out what's going on. But it moves slowly, which I adjusted to and actually really liked. Um, and I know I said this about Ordinary Grace, but this is a really atmospheric book too. The descriptions of St. X, the island where the girl gets murdered, and then later of New York um, where the sister's living and um, pursuing this man who was at least somehow involved with her sister's disappearance. They're really, really, like they draw you in and I felt like, especially with St. X, I could picture everything, which is always cool when that happens. Um, and I think the the portrait of Claire's obsession really makes sense too because she was so young when her sister died she almost didn't get it and then later in life it kind of comes as she grows up to become her sister's age and beyond she realizes that you know her sister was a full of a person and a, and a someone who experienced a lot of life that Claire hadn't really been a part of because she was so young and she just becomes more and more curious and more and more obsessed with finding the truth. So this is a good summer read, I think. Um, of all the ones I've listed, maybe the best summer read. Um, but if you're looking for a thriller, thriller, I don't think this is necessarily for you. This is definitely more of a, a slow, a slow moving, um, but still suspenseful title. So that is St. X. And then my last one, this is kind of funny. Okay, so I just checked this out because I love cooking. Um, and I wanted some new recipe ideas. Uh, this is the kitchen cookbook, but what I, and they do have good recipes in here, but what I loved is their suggestions for how to like organize and keep your kitchen. And a lot of the times when cookbooks talk about that, it's for people with enormous kitchens, which does not relate to me, but this had ideas all the way from kitchens in a studio apartment to kitchens in like a small house to kitchens that are half outdoors to kitchens in indeed huge houses but they had some amazing suggestions for how to inexpensively modify your kitchen and how to store your cooking tools so that they'll be in the best possible spot for using them and how to um, maybe do some small updates that will make your kitchen look a ton better even if you don't want to 
do a full remodel. So that ended up being the most fun part for me was just getting these suggestions from here about little tiny changes I could make to improve my pretty small and rental kitchen. Um, but again, lots of recommendations too if you have a big kitchen or if you own it and are, uh, own your home and are looking to remodel. Um, and also really good recipes. So I thought I would just throw this in here. A lot of good summer recipes, actually, I thought. Stuff that would be, um, that are, is fun to make when it's hot out. So I just wanted to throw this out there if anyone is interested in it. I'm going to return it to the library soon and maybe you want to place a hole. So that was the kitchen. Um, we talked about St. X. We talked about All American Boys. We talked about Sorry for Your Trouble. I mentioned Snow Crash and Ordinary Grace. And if you are playing the summer game, we have our code today, Summer Reading Rex. Um, so make sure that if you watched, excuse me, you um, enter that in and uh, get your points for playing the summer game. And uh, yeah, let uh, we'll tune in for um, the next one. I hope to do another quarantine reads in August, and um, hope that you're enjoying your summer reading. Thanks for listening.